So the tying run is at second. The run that would win the World Series is at third. I remember perfectly. I was sitting in my living room with my gang from Expos Nation. It was the Phillies and the Jays. You have to remember, Toronto and Montreal is water and fire. Joe Carter is the batter. Now the 2-2. Two -two. Well hit down the left field line. Way back and gone! When Joe Carter hit that, and I heard that announcer say, Touch them all, Joe! You'll never hit a bigger home run in your life! Crushing. Crushing. Joe And a bit of jealousy because we were here first. The winners and still world champion. All I could see when he was running around the bases was seeing the Expos doing the same thing. We're seeing a Larry Walker hitting that home run. Walker hits one way out into the bleachers. We would have liked to have been the first Canadian team to uh, uh, to win the World Series. I think that would have been terrific. The Blue Jays have repeated as World Series champions. Packing the place every night and winning back-to-back -back championships. That was supposed to be us. It was torture to watch the Blue Jays win the World Series, but it was tempered by the fact that the Expos had an incredible finish at the end of 1993. The Expos won 30 of their final 39 games in 93, finishing a close second to the eventual National League champion Phillies. Montreal fans had every reason to be hopeful. We were just improving every year. It was unbelievable, and I knew our time was going to come. Manager Felipe Alou had one of the best outfields in the game. Larry Walker was in right, Marquise Grissom in center, and Felipe's son Moises was in left. Montreal Expos were really, really kicking butt that year, and Philippe Alou was about to have some tremendous success up there because they had a great, great team. That the Expos had the best team in baseball in 1994 was not lost on us before it happened. I think we had a pretty fair idea that that was going to be a team after we watched them down the stretch the year before. On the eve of the 94 season, some pundits felt the Expos had a shot to follow Toronto's back-to-back -back pennants and become the next Canadian team to reach the World Series. But while the team was solid, baseball's collective bargaining agreement had run out, and that spelled potential problems for this star-crossed franchise. There was the specter of the possibility of a shutdown hanging over that season. The dislike, the distrust of both sides to each other kept getting worse and worse. Neither side was willing to budge. They knew it was going to be a long strike. They knew that it was some big issues that year. The clock is ticking because the owners have said they will unilaterally implement their salary cap proposal after the season. The players have a simple choice. Take the salary cap proposal now, take it after the season because they impose it, or strike. It was obvious that bad times had a chance to be right around the corner. Throughout the negotiations, the Expos did their best to keep their focus on baseball. You dream to play on a team where you go to the ballpark every day and you're going to win every day. We were the best team and there was no doubt, I think in anybody's mind, that we were the best team. But you always had that, oh, the strike, the strike was there. Of course it scared us. Rightfully, it scared us. None of us would like to go on a strike, but some things had, had to happen. We knew for the good of baseball, you had to negotiate a new contract. For the good of the Expos, he could have waited another year. Three years before the triumph and tragedy of the Expos' 94 season was the 91 campaign, one of the darkest in franchise history. Calderon, and he is disgusted with himself. 
Their 71 and 90 record that year was their worst in 16 seasons, and it wasn't just the team that appeared to be collapsing. Ooh, Wallach chased a bad one. Strike three. The Expos do not have a hit yet. No, Olympic Stadium itself was imploding as a 55-ton beam fell from the roof onto the field, forcing the team to play its final 13 home games on the road. But then this was just another in a long litany of problems inflicted on the Expos and their fans by this stadium, a facility that wasn't even built for them. Olympic Stadium was built for the Olympics. It really wasn't a baseball facility. I remember walking in just before the Olympics and I almost had a heart attack when I saw it because this was going to be a failure. Olympic Stadium to Quebecers was a bit of a thorn in the thigh because of the costs. The stadium eventually cost $1 billion. And as you know, the roof never worked. They spent a lot of money on that place. The fans never liked it. It's just that simple. It was a terrible place to watch a baseball game. It was cold, it was hollow, it was nothing more than the world's largest ashtray. Coming off a terrible season in an equally flawed building, all the Expos could do was keep their chins up. Gotta have a positive attitude because I mean, we're the worst last year, you know, it's gonna get better, so there's no pressure on us. No, the pressure was on Expo's general manager, Dan Duquette. I sat down with Bill Stoneman and Claude Brochu, and together we did a uh, three-year projection of the players in terms of their talent, in terms of their value to the team, and in terms of what the team could pay them. But when we put the blueprint together to have a decent team over a couple of years, we were really shooting for 1994. The process began immediately after the 91 season when the Expos made some much needed additions. They traded for catcher Darren Fletcher and a pair of solid pitchers in Ken Hill and John Wetland. We had traded for a top starter and a closer and that gave us the bookends for our pitching staff. Hill went on to win 16 games in 92 and Wetland registered 37 saves, giving the Expos 16 more wins than the previous year. Aiding the turnaround was a man named Alou. No, not Moises, who was a rookie that year. His father, Felipe, who took over a most familiar team as manager in late May. Most of these people have played for me somewhere, and they know that I want Axon to do the impossible. Sometimes he did it. Felipe possessed the perfect temperament to lead a young squad. Well, you know, one man can't do it. You know, it takes all of us to, to see what's going on. He was fun to learn from. I believe any, any time somebody's still a bag, it's my fault that they score. And that's what Felipe was and is. He, he's, he's a baseball man through and through. With a full season at the helm, Felipe guided the Expos to a 94-68 and 68 record in 93, closing out the year in furious fashion to finish three games behind the eventual National League champions. They simply ran out of time. The only thing that stopped the Expos from overtaking the Phillies in 1993 was the schedule. So you could see it coming. And for the second time in this series, the Expos have come up with a rally as they sweep the series. They were starting to develop a little brashness. They were going to have a swagger when the next season started. The one caveat to 94 was economics. It was a recurring theme in Montreal, one that ultimately became synonymous with the franchise. We knew that we had a very tight, close, short window to keep this team together because of the fiscal restraints that we were working under. As such, Duquette made the decision to part ways with fan favorite Delino De Shields. In exchange, the Expos received a promising but slight 22-year-old pitcher named Pedro Martinez. The genesis of that trade really was Dennis Martinez was playing out his option. There was no way with our revenues that we could fit him in with this group of young players that we were putting together. So we had to trade one of our young players to get a good pitcher to replace Dennis Martinez. I was one of the guys who roasted Dan Duquette because all I knew was how skinny Pedro Martinez was. This kid's only about 160 pounds. That Juan Lasorda, his own manager in L.A., said he wasn't strong enough to be a successful starting pitcher. We were blasted here. We were the biggest idiots, only doing it for money. We would be able to use Dennis Martinez's sweater and not have to buy a new one. I mean, we were killed. And yet, when we made the trade, Dan said to me, you know what, with this trade, 
we're going to win in 94. Tip of the cap from a guy who deserves the ovation he's getting, Pedro Martinez. This city has always been and it will always be about the Montreal Canadiens. But when the Expos came in 69, you had this incredible love affair. I remember sitting at our kitchen table listening to a call-in show what our new team's name would be. Someone called in and said, well, we just had Expo 67. Why don't we name it the Expos? And it stuck. The Montreal Expos were born during baseball's centennial season of 1969, the first ever major league team to play its home games somewhere other than the United States. When they came alive, they weren't just another team. They were the only team that wasn't an American team. They were Canada's baseball team. We will all be proud of our Montreal Expos. This is what the city wanted. They wanted good baseball, and they're going to get it. People forget that this was a pretty good baseball market, that the Montreal Royals did pretty well here. The Royals were a Montreal institution for 62 seasons, the last 16 the Dodgers AAA affiliate, and the stepping stone for some iconic baseball legends. Jackie Robinson played here. Roberto Clemente played here. For Montreal, they had had the experience of being in AAA. Now they wouldn't settle for that anymore. They're too big, and Montreal was suddenly a major league town. The tears were just rolling down my cheeks, and frankly, I was standing next to Mayor Drapel, and the tears were rolling down his cheeks, too. Heir to the Seagram's Wines and Spirits companies, Bronfman was a Montreal native, and his pride knew no bounds. To have 45,000 Americans stand at attention for our anthem, that was a huge day. The home opener at Jerry Park was equally historic, for it was the first major league game to be played on international soil. Crowd beginning to stand. That's really something, a standing ovation before the first ball is pitched out. The fans went insane. You couldn't get another person in the ballpark. They had people that were standing on ladders outside the ballpark trying to look over the fences. The excitement was big time, it really was. That was so much fun. Jerry Park was about as intimate as it gets. Anywhere in that park, you were touching players practically. Nobody cared that they lost 20-odd games in a row, that they finished with 110 losses. Major League Baseball was in our town, and we celebrated it. Right from the very start, the fans took to Rusty Staub, and the baseball writer, Ted Blackman, dubbed him Le Grand Orange. See that hair? That's why they call him Le Grand Orange. Who didn't love Le Grand Orange? Although I do have a fixation for shortstops. He became the first baseball superstar in Montreal. Rusty Staub is embraced by Expos fans as their own living legend. Not only could Rusty hit and hit for power, he actually embraced the culture of Montreal. He learned French. The fact that I tried to speak their language was the one thing that really separated me from the rest of the guys. He was one of those guys who showed he loved to play here. And of course, he was big and tall, and he had a mass of red hair, and he was amazing. So you can imagine the shock Expos fans experienced when, after just three seasons, Le Grand Orange was forced to bid au revoir. When Rusty Staub was traded to the Mets, that was the first time I felt that there was another element to professional sports. It did break everyone's hearts, certainly just a little bit, that he was not going to be le voltageur de droit for the uh, Les Expos any longer. It was hard for the fans to say goodbye to their first baseball hero. And it was just the first in a long line of personnel decisions that would go on to reflect baseball's changing financial landscape. When free agency came about, we had the first pick, and we picked Reggie Jackson. And then the Yankees started bidding for him, and San Diego did. And Reggie eventually signed with New York, and I remember George Steinbrenner said, Bronfman might have Seagram's, Ray Kroc might have McDonald's, but I got the Big Apple. So I said, there's only one way we're going to be able to do this, and that's to grow our own talent. Charles did what he had to do to survive, and that was he put a lot of resources into the scouting staff. He put a lot of resources into the minor league system, and he said, fellas, I want you to go out and build the best organization in baseball. And while the Expos endured eight losing seasons at Jerry Park, the organization's overall plan was being executed to precision. I got to give their scouting department and their development department a lot of credit because, I mean, they were signing some monster players. 
Steve Rogers joined the team in 73, followed by Larry Parrish and Gary Carter one year later. In 1975, it was Ellis Valentine, and Andre Dawson came on board in 76. I don't think that we did it to get any credit for it, but we did it for us to save our own skins. The last vestiges of Bronfman's insistence on building from the ground up can still be seen throughout baseball years after anyone's worn an Expos uniform. It's no wonder this franchise was often hailed as one of baseball's best. If you go through the Expos history, as of 1969 till the end, I challenge any organization to have developed so many outstanding players. I had a special feeling toward this 1994 team. I thought, finally, here is the championship team that's going to take us to the promised land. We have a great manager. We have a good young player, good pitching. We play fearless, and we don't care who we play, and I think we have the talent to do it this year. The Expos appeared unfazed when before the 94 season, the powerful Atlanta Braves joined the East Division in a long-needed realignment. There was no team that was going to stand in the way of the Montreal Expos in the National League East, whether it was the Braves, the Phillies, combination of two other teams playing against them at the same time. The 94 Expos were that good. What a story. The best team in baseball resides in Montreal. Just 17 years earlier, much the same level of excitement gripped the city when the Expos moved into Olympic Stadium. Valerie! The first game there, uh, there were over 50,000 people. I remember being at the home opener in 77. They lost 72 against the Phillies, but I'd never sat so high up in anything in my life. It was huge. It was immense. It was enormous. And it felt great. It felt really major league. Montreal was now in the big leagues, and the expectation level was raised considerably. In part due to the presence of new manager Dick Williams, a two-time world champion who had little to lose with this team. The year before, they lost 107 ball games, so we had no place to go but up. And why not? For the young seeds the Expos talent scouts had planted were about to blossom. Men like Gary Carter, Andre Dawson, Larry Parrish, Ellis Valentine, Warren Cromarty, Steve Rogers, Bill Gullickson, and Scott Sanderson comprised a core that was eager to win. By 1979, we had become a contending team. And behind this homegrown talent, they captivated the city of Montreal with a 95 and 65 record. Their first ever winning season brought them a second place finish, but a first for the franchise. We drew 2,100,000 people. Uh, the whole nation, Canada, was turned on by the Expos. That's all. But the promise of even greater success in 1980 ran headlong into labor unrest. It would be unfortunate if it comes to that. It looks like, with us being so far apart, that some kind of a work stoppage will be forthcoming. And one did, indeed, bring spring training to a halt for eight days. A new deal was struck, though there was a good chance that talks might resume in 81. But despite the labor issues, more than 2 million Expos fans turned out again in 1980, fourth most in the National League, only to be disappointed in the end. It's 1980, we went down to the final weekend of the season with the Phillies. Tied up at four in the 11th, the 2-0 pitch. Uh-oh. That will be a home run for Mike Schmidt. 1979, we lost out to the Pirates by two games, and in 1980, we lost out to the Phillies by one game. It was becoming a frustrating trend, especially for a team that was trying to maintain its eager new fan base. We didn't win, and at the end of the day, winning is where it's at, because you can guarantee uh, pretty full houses for the next five years if you ever win. So the team made a few adjustments in 1981 that they hoped would push them over the top. Homegrown and ready-to-go rookies Tim Wallach and Tim Raines both cracked the starting lineup. Wallach's arrived, the Raines had arrived. Wow, that team was getting good. Unfortunately, the new kids were not the year's enduring memory. The strike is on. The reports we've been getting indicate that a substantial number of the players have already left for home. 
baseball's first ever mid-season work stoppage forced some major changes. With no baseball for 50 days, the schedule was shortened, and a unique split-season playoff format ended up benefiting the Expos. First part of the season, the Expos are not there. But they win the second half of the season. I'll tell you what's really exciting. It's been a long time since we've been waiting for this, baby. Three years. Now three's the charge, so we got to go. It felt so damn good to know that there was tickets on sale for the playoffs and that there was this chance that the Montreal Expos would be in the World Series. The prospect looked even brighter when they dispatched the Phillies in five games in the first ever division series. The league championship series against the Dodgers went down to a deciding fifth game as well. And tied at one in the ninth, Expos ace Steve Rogers on just two days rest was called on in relief. The Expos closer, Jeff Reardon, was not available to pitch. He had had some back problems. Steve Rogers was full of adrenaline. He had never come out of the bullpen before. He was too strong. Rick Monday, the batter, with a game tied up at one. No one knew it at the time, but the fortune of a franchise was about to be decided by one pitch. One pitch changed definitely the course of the history of the Expos. Here's the 3-1 pitch, and it's swung on, fly ball, center field, Dawson going back. And I can still see Andre going back, going back. Still on the run, trouble at the fence. And I said, oh, that's gone. Home run, Monday, 2-1 to one Dodgers. Awful way to end the season. The Expos version of Blue Monday will never be forgotten in Montreal. For despite winning more games than any National League team from 1979 through 82, this would be the closest the Expos would ever come to a World Series. It was just unfortunate that we never materialized the overall talent that we had to win a World Series. Then eventually the team started to break up. Primarily in an effort to keep the payroll under control, Montreal bid adieu to many of its core players over the next five years. Parrish, Cromarty, Carter, Gullickson, and Dawson all became ex-spos. These were business decisions, but much like when Rusty Staub was traded, Montreal fans had to once again endure the loss of their heroes. That just took the wind out of everyone's sails because you could look around the major leagues and see an all-star team made up of ex-Expo players. The pain was felt at the box office, too, as attendance dwindled to just over a million fans by 1986, the same season that Claude Brochu was named the new team president. When I took over from John McHale, it became very clear in discussions with, uh, with Charles Bronfman that he was frustrated. We had these young, feisty teams and damn good teams, and I'd go to a stadium and see 70,000 people in this cavernous place. I'd be heartbroken. Now in his 18th season as Expos owner, Bronfman's zest for the business of baseball was waning. Charles Bronfman became very concerned with the direction baseball was taking. When I first went into baseball, if you had a really lousy year, you could lose $100,000. When I left baseball, if you had a really lousy year, you could lose between 10 and $20 million. The changing landscape led Charles to seek out a buyer for his beloved Expos, with the provision that they keep the team in Montreal. When Charles Brown decided to sell the team, we knew we were in trouble. Finding that buyer, though, was no easy task. The Expos proved to be a hard sell. It took Brochu more than two years to cobble together a consortium of 12 owners, a process that raised some red flags with the fans. It was hard to believe that the Expos were owned by many companies. That was a bit odd, and let's face it, it's not a word you hear every day, consortium. Almost immediately, this new group discovered that no one entity among the 12 had the monetary wherewithal to absorb the financial challenges that were unique to Montreal's small market existence. TV and radio rights were a prime example. Dave Van Horn tonight is broadcasting his 4,000th game for the Montreal Expos. From 1969 through 76, the Expos were Canada's team, seen and heard coast to coast. But that would change. Toronto Blue Jays came in. They wanted their territory. They were granted it. And that forced the Expos out of the most lucrative part of the country. Montreal became a provincial team. It was the Quebec team. 
the best we ever did from a rights perspective. Probably somewhere between twenty-two and twenty-five thousand dollars a game. Somebody like the Dodgers at the time were getting two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a game. Factor in an unfavorable exchange rate where the Expos generated Canadian funds while paying their players in American money, and it was clear that Bronfman's deep pockets would be missed. There was no way you could turn around to and say, oh, we're in trouble, Mr. Bronfman's going to help us. We knew that corporate institutes could not help us. So Mr. Bronfman is the biggest loss in the history of Expos. This has been in my pocket since 1994. It's the 94 team. I've carried that with me ever since because that was the most talented team, most exciting team that I'd ever been a part of. Grayson will head to third. He might circle the bases. Here comes Marquise. The throw by Pena. Safe for the Admirals win. Three and two. They had speed. They had power. They had pitching. Ken Hill gets the shutout victory. Leadership on the front end of the rotation and Martinez and Hill. Those guys threw 94, 95 miles an hour. Conine is out of there. We were having so much fun. We were so young, so fast. Everybody threw hard. And Wetland gets the strikeout and the save. You have to understand, too, that we had... Why is this a little left field? Marquis Grissom from center field. Larry Walker, right field. And balls didn't touch the outfield. We told you how the Expo outfield turns doubles into outs, and there's an example of it. We have a certain cockiness to us, and we all know how good the other one is. Everybody got a real good strong arm, and I think we can cover a lot of ground. I think that's what makes us a little different from other outfielders. This one ripped to right. Here comes Walker. He got it. Everybody can run. Everybody got a good arm, and everybody can pretty much hit, too. And he hits this high and deep, but it's way up in the second, third deck. In the green seats. Despite the Expos' money woes, the 94 team was filled with promise, but they were in fact a work in progress. Testing one, two, one. <laughs> we started off slow. We were under 500, and I remember Felipe got a little upset with the effort the team was giving at the time. Another quick throw. Oh! Picks him off first base. Shortly after that, the team just turned it around, and you could sense that everything was clicking. And you hear the noise. There is a lot to cheer if you are a Montreal Expo fan tonight. The Expos were 21 games over 500 at the All-Star break. And with five representatives at the Midsummer Classic, they showed two nations that their success was no fluke. Moises Alou, first at-bat of the night for him. Salou's drive to left center did more than just snap an all-star skid. It was fantastic to see one of my guys do it, because we were always so overlooked. Well, it's tough to ignore a team that goes 20 and 7 after the all-star break en route to its best record ever. And the Expos, they're on a pace to win 110 games. The best team in baseball. The best team and the best young team. The best team in baseball. Their record about to be 30 games over the 500 mark for the first time since 1979. We had a chance, realistically, not to go all the way. But this snake-bit franchise would never get the chance to fulfill that dream for the game's labor woes once again reared their ugly head. Baseball faces in 1994 for the first time the diminution in its revenues. I deeply regret the fact that the players see no reason to respond to that set of problems. It strikes me as a terrible shame that because the large market and the small market owners can't agree on how to sort out baseball's revenue among themselves, that they have to force the players to strike. On August 11th of 94, the Expos held a six-game lead over the Braves in the NL East and owned baseball's best record. And then... Like a lot of things in life, you anticipate something and fear that it's coming, hope that it isn't. And when the day is here, there's an incredible amount of sadness. It was very sad to see what was happening. It's sad we had to leave this way, but sometimes you gotta do what you have to do. Everybody believed that baseball would find a way to correct the situation. We might miss a couple games, but they will find a way to resolve the problem. And then September happened. Salut, on a une grève. 
qui a duré jusqu'à date 34 jours. I remember Mr. Beauchamp announcing it. C'est qu'on va procéder vraiment à l'annulation de la saison euh, 94 et des séries après saison. Finally, they get the chance after 25 years of existence and it gets wiped out. How would you deal with that as a fan? Whatever city you're in, that would have been devastating. And I only wanted to win a World Series once in my life. Best team in baseball resides in Montreal. And this is one of the best teams uh, Montreal sports has ever seen. It cannot end like this. It was a death knell to the Montreal Expos. Through all the wars and everything else, we had a World Series. But we didn't that year. Canadian team and nobody cared. It affected a whole city and pretty much destroyed baseball in Montreal. The cancellation of the 94 season had league-wide implications. Several players were flirting with magical numbers, including Tony Gwynn's chance to hit 400. But few suffered more than the city of Montreal. What we had to go through after the 94 season, I mean, was absolutely devastating, not only to our organization, but to our fans. Here they were on the verge of perhaps winning the world championship. They were certainly favored. And the season ends. In that respect, the work stoppage was a huge tragedy, certainly for Montreal. We were witnessing history in the making, not only because of what the team was doing on a nightly basis, but these were all players who hadn't yet reached their peak. So people were very disappointed, but hopeful that next year with the same nucleus, we would be successful. But the team never got the chance to fulfill that promise and prove they were the best in baseball. For during spring training of 95, new Expos general manager Kevin Malone was instructed to jettison some key players. Rissom, Wetland, Walker, and Hill. In two days in spring training, Kevin Malone was forced to deal away four of the best players in baseball. How can you get equal value for that? They trade John Wetland for Fernando Seguignol. They trade Marquise Grissom for Tony Tarasco. Larry Walker, they don't even offer him anything. No offer, no arbitration. They don't get draft picks for him. <laughs> It was the event that really started to turn the franchise around in a negative way. I was extremely hurt, feeling, uh, we say en français, impuissant, powerless. I was like, every day, you, you know, another knife in the side. Our team was dismantled. The Expo's infamous fire sale of 95 could be traced directly to the cancellation of the 94 season. We were used to living pretty close to the vest, and all of a sudden, we were losing a tremendous amount of money. The Expos had lost the revenue from 29 late-season home games in 94. And even if they hadn't reached the World Series, they were still guaranteed 16 million Canadian dollars in television revenue from the Fall Classic, which they never got. With a 94 payroll of just over 18 million, these losses crippled the franchise. You had too many people that didn't have enough money to make decisions on stuff you needed money for. We could have kept that team together one more year with that experience. Who knows what we would have done. They didn't even try to keep the team together. Ownership completely betrayed the fan base. They completely betrayed the team's capacity to win. They were able to keep a couple of guys. They chose not to. They chose to rebuild. Without question, that was the beginning of the end of the franchise. Nobody wanted to try to understand, you know, what we were going through. Everybody's looking for good players. We had them here. To bring back that team wouldn't have been that crazy. All it would have taken is about $10 million. It's very easy to be critical with other people's money. You knew that these guys were simply trying to balance their books. Montreal ownership coming up short when it came time to keep the team together to invest in their product. Instead, they divested. They say you got to spend money to make money. They had the opportunity to bring back some of the best players in the history of the franchise. Look, if by midseason it doesn't work out for you, trade the guys. That's fine. But you already had these guys in your midst and you let it go. In 1995, the Expos finished last, 12 games under 500. We wanted to finish where we start. 
We wanted to show everybody that we were the best team in baseball. Unfortunately, we had to get rid of our keys. Larry, Kenny, Wetland. You don't realize how great of a ball club you had until you lose those guys. To make matters even worse, Expo's fans had to endure watching the four that they lost play in the 95 postseason. If you open up the TV and you take a look, you see all our players are all over the place. They're doing so well. Grissom on the run. The team of the 90s has its world championship. Part of me was happy for them, but I was envious. I couldn't believe I had had these guys in my hand the year before, and next thing you know, they're winning it with someone else. It's tough to swallow. The 95 Expos, like many teams, experienced a drastic drop in attendance. It was now easier for fans to stay away from a stadium that always seemed to be somewhat out of the way. The biggest problem for Olympic Stadium was location. It was in the wrong place. This was a stadium that needed to be built downtown Montreal. That's where things were happening and still are. No question, Stade Olympique was passe. So Claude Brochu came up with a plan that he believed would help revive the franchise. If we can get ourselves a new ballpark downtown, we'll bring baseball back to the city like it never was before. A downtown stadium would have catapulted the franchise into among the best in Major League Baseball. Every other city where they built it downtown, whether it was Denver or Baltimore, Cleveland, it reignited all the interest in the ball club. And do I think it would have been a success? Yes, I do. Paying strict attention to how new downtown ballparks could impact a franchise and a city, the Expos carefully crafted a plan. We had decided we needed three levels of contribution. We needed provincial government, federal government, and we needed the fans to contribute. Probably one third of the amount needed to build a stadium each. Canada's federal government did its share by pledging this downtown site. You see that tree? Where the Canadian flag is? That's where I'll be sitting. I remember I was in California when they called and said they were gonna have this big rally. You people are too good and deserve too much for this organization to leave and go elsewhere. There's too many memories. Brochu could sense the momentum, and he'd assigned a unique financial plan for the provincial government that all but assured its success. His group arranged a meeting with the Premier of Quebec, Lucien Bouchard, for confirmation. The Expos and the Minister of Finances had worked out a deal. Taxpayers were prepared to fund their share here in Quebec on the basis of being repaid by player salary income taxes. Mr. Brochu's plan was, if the Expos are not here, those income taxes, you're not going to get them anyway. So let's use them and pay a stadium. The Minister of Finance agreed. When Mr. Brochu met the Prime Minister, Mr. Bouchard, at that time, there was no more deal. Something happened. Et 5,000 emplois répartis sur le territoire ont plus d'importance pour nous qu'en tout respect pour ce merveilleux sport qu'est le baseball, deux douzaines de citoyens des États-Unis. There would be no provincial funding. So that was like a hammer. Merci. 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 Brochu was shocked, but armed with 10,000 season tickets already sold and ballpark naming rights secured for 10 years, he enlisted MLB Commissioner Bud Selig to try and secure a change of heart. I thought we had very productive meetings. They were constructive. There was no question that franchise needed a new stadium, but it just didn't materialize. And we tried and we tried. As Bud was trying to be persuasive and trying to explain the importance from a baseball perspective and explain the, you know, baseball economics, it was clear it was just going in one ear and out the other. Once that decision was made, everyone in the organization realized that uh, it was purely a question of time before the team would be relocated. Once it became clear that a new downtown stadium would not be built, baseball fans in Montreal vented their anger and frustration towards some more than others. Claude must go! Claude must go! Under fire from both the public and the consortium he headed, Brochu sold his shares and controlling interest to New York art dealer Jeffrey Loria. Claude Brochu wanted to see the Montreal Expo succeed, but he failed. 
people knew to the lengths that Claude Brochu was going to so that the fans of Montreal could keep their team, they would have really appreciated the work that he did for them. I know if we could have gotten this ballpark built downtown, that things would have been different. However, there was no way that the government wanted to do it, but they were wrong. They hurt a province, they hurt a city, and they hurt a population. The last years of the Expos, when Mr. Laurier was the owner, and the Major League Baseball took over ownership, was like going to the hospital to see somebody you loved suffering from terminal cancer. Kind of preparing myself for the worst here. And you've got 5,000 people in the stands every night. Can't last forever. But they had great fans. J'aime les Expos. I love the Expos, boy. J'aime les Expos. You know, a lot of people that really loved baseball. Many years, we outdid the Yankees in attendance. Does anyone ever say that? No, they concentrate on a time we only had 2,000 fans in the stands. The fan base was slapped around like a rag doll. They said, oh, people aren't into baseball in Montreal anymore. Give me a break. It was particularly painful to watch baseball games in an empty stadium, knowing full well how things could have been. It had been a trying decade for Expos fans since the fleeting triumph of the 94 season. And on the day of the last home game in the 2004 campaign, the news they dreaded sadly came to pass. It's official now. Major League Baseball has announced the Expos are headed to Washington, D.C. It was hard. And, you know, it was 31,000 people and everybody was crying. Grown men kids on their parents' shoulders. This was disappointing, and we didn't want to move, but in the end, it was reality. We had to move. Prior to that final game, the franchise honored what might have been the greatest team never to reach the postseason. Even though we didn't win a World Series, and we never even won a playoff game. However, in 94, I'll still maintain that we would have won the World Series. <laughs> one of the game's tragedies that we weren't allowed to continue that season through to see where that team ended up and see where the franchise would have ended up. It was a personal tragedy for these players who missed their chance to shine. It was a tragedy for the baseball fans in Montreal because this was the best team that they ever had. But perhaps the greatest tragedy was the one that befell the fans in the province of Quebec and the city of Montreal. I am terribly sad. I think it was a great lift for the city, for the province, and for the country when they came in. We'd like to wish the city of Montreal and the Expos good luck at Montreal. And it's been not the same kind of summer anymore, I've been told, since they're gone. Au revoir à les Expos. Life goes on when you lose a brother or a best friend. That's how I've often spoken about the Montreal Expos. It's like I lost somebody that I loved. I still look for the teams listening in, in the standings in the National League East, and I haven't seen them for quite a while. It's true, the Washington Nationals now occupy that place in the standings, and it's hard to find reminders of the Expos these days. But the team's legacy of drafting and developing great players should never be forgotten. Andre Dawson. The Hawk, Montreal, National League, 1976 to 1986. Because I don't have a team anymore. But for one day, I can pretend. In a strange twist of fate in this hockey-centric city, the one place where the Expos greats have been immortalized is right alongside the legends of Les Habitants. More than anything else, I think it's sad for the fans of Montreal that there's no longer a baseball franchise. The loss of their beloved Expos still resonates in Quebec, but no one can ever take away the sheer excitement and promise of the 94 team and what might have been. There was a hole left in all of us. And when you go around baseball and you see the guys that are retired now that were on that team, or you see the coaches who are on that team, we do feel like we have a brotherhood. Unfortunately, they're also going to be remembered as of the greatest team that never got an opportunity to, to show they were a great team. If they won the World Series, they would have gotten a new ballpark, and baseball would have been very different. The Montreal Expos would still be 
it was Pedro Martinez who actually acknowledged Montreal in his post-series remarks, and that really struck a chord with a lot of people. I would like to share this with the people in Montreal that, that are not going to have a team anymore. A lot of tears uh, were shed that night when Pedro saluted Montreal when his Red Sox won. My heart and my, my, my ring. My ring is with them too. Everyone still remembers the Expos fondly. It was very much a part of Montreal, and when people ask me what team I'm a fan of, I always say the Expos. Even though they don't exist anymore, I still tell my kids I'm an Expos fan.